responsibility from the environmental management of management point of view. And these things now lead you to what we call sustainable development. Um, involved by uh, uh, this uh, UN adapted uh, land administration model. Um, I'll talk about the types of land tenure in Zimbabwe. Basically, we are aware of freehold. I see Mr. Maguena is here. Uh, is registering deeds all the time. This is land. This is where land is held under the authority of a title deed. Now, in terms of the discussion that we are having, and in terms of the politics of the country at the moment, there is a, someone a pseudo someone who writes under the pseudonym of um, Igo Mombe. And in his writing, it appears that he is someone that is very seriously connected to power in the government, who is, uh, who's got cabinet thinking, uh, or government thinking on the issue of land tenure uh, in Zimbabwe. And he says that freehold title, and he was making reference to campaign promises that were being made by political parties in the country. And he was saying that one candidate was saying, we are going to give people, uh, our farmers are going to give them title deeds, so on and so on. And uh, Igor Mombe was then saying, uh, look, the title deed is a defenseless piece of paper. In other words, it will result in the farmer falling into a position of being defenseless. Because once you put a title deed, and uh, with land markets that we have, we will have a situation where land will be consolidated into a few people with deep pockets. And he was therefore necessarily advocating for a situation where government would regulate uh, to avoid capture of land and consolidation into the same people that owned the land previously. That is the, in, in terms of trying to give you the disadvantage of free or title where land is then used for the collateralization uh, uh, to raise finance. Then the list of all, this involves the situation with acquisition of land use rights with obligations uh, and responsibilities defined for a defined period of time and also where lenders are actually being paid for the use of that land for that defined period of time. In terms of the Deeds Registry Act, uh, Chapter 2005, and in terms of the Regional Town and Country Planning Act 2912, any lease for a period of 10 years and above has to be registered in the Deeds Registry's uh, office. In, the, with the, in terms of the leasehold, land ownership does not change. Uh, but the lessee can use the land to the exclusion of the lessor uh, during the subsistence of the lease. Now, in terms of the constitution of Zimbabwe, uh, uh, the, the 2018 Constitution of Zimbabwe, uh, all acquired land face in the state, and people can use it in terms of a lease agreement. And this is why we're talking about the lease agreement, the 99 year lease, uh, or the A1 permits. Other types of land tenure in Zimbabwe are the common, common hold or the communal servitude easements, resettlement permits, and state land. In the region, a number of countries in Southern Africa and indeed in the world have already spoken about Australia, about Hong Kong, Australia, the Netherlands, all these countries um, use leases, long-term leases. In South Africa, uh, you can acquire rights to use land for 30 to 50 year periods um, on, a, on a lease.
is especially the large scale forest uh, farming lands. In Mozambique, all land, this is residential farming land, all land is owned by the state. Uh, in Botswana as well, big farms are owned by the state and people use them or companies use them in terms of lease agreements. The reason why I'm giving this example is that what we need to do is to, it appears that in Mozambique there is massive investment in agriculture, notwithstanding the fact that people are using leases. In South Africa it is the same. In Hong Kong, I'm going to say that Hong Kong has the most successful lease uh, instruments uh, in the world and they still use leases. So, I will look a little bit, uh, talk a little bit about the 1990 lease uh, agreement later on, but it would appear that the South African government, Mozambique government, Botswana and other countries don't necessarily have the challenges that Zimbabwe is facing in terms of using leases as instruments of underpinning finance for agriculture. So, what I'm saying is that it may therefore, I haven't looked at our 1990 lease agreement, but it may therefore mean that it may therefore, it gives you this, an impression that it is not the lease that is a problem. It is not the concept of a lease that is a problem, but it is perhaps a uh, perception that have, been, that have developed as a result of how uh, we proceeded with the, our resettlement program, and which is uh, where perceptions of tenure security, insecurity in Zimbabwe may then arise. Uh, I'll talk about the 1990 year now. My observation is that the, the 1990 year agreement that we are using is very cumbersome and tends to be intimidatory. Uh, you, know, you know, when you talk about contracts, people always say that the devil is in the detail. And uh, we are saying that the lease agreement in Zimbabwe, the 1990 year lease agreement, is about 50 pages. Uh, whereas when you look at a normal title deed, uh, normally it's about three to five pages, maybe at most seven pages. Uh, in my view, some of the information that is contained in the uh, current 99 year lease agreement should in fact be removed and captured in an enabling legislation, where we then simply, when we talk about the disagreement, we simply talk about the, maybe the conditions precedent, but the rest is, is really in the, in the enabling legislation or statutory instrument. Uh, and that reduces the, the extent of detail that is in the, in the list document. In the current form, well, it appears that the lease agreement is a financial instrument with limited competitiveness, transferability, and bankability. Um, and as a result, this is why financial institutions in the country may be timid to extend financing to agriculture. And as a result, because of that limited finance, our ability to be sustainable and productive on the farms is also compromised. And uh, when you analyze clause 25, uh, 2 of the 1990 Lease Agreement, you see that uh, the agreement offers a limited security of tenure to potential agricultural financiers. Because um, 
you know, in the event, what it says is that in the event that uh, uh, the borrower has failed to pay, uh, the, the lender can actually uh, acquire that lease agreement and put it on the market. And if in one year he fails to, to find someone who will use that lease agreement or the leasehold for, for the reasonable period for them to recover their money, they must then engage in farming themselves. And, no, look, I'm a banker, I'm not a farmer. <laughs> and it also says, uh, if you, when the lender, if the lender fails to find someone who can actually advance the money that was borrowed in replacement of the, the money that would have been advanced to the borrower, he must mutually, in, in mutual agreement with government, uh, surrender the, the leasehold back to the government, and the government will then find uh, a suitable uh, lessee, a new suitable lessee who will then pay back. And all that is risky, and uh, in my view, uh, there is no responsibility at all on the part of borrowers who may indeed take money and use it to do other things other than financing the purposes for which they, they borrowed the money. So there also appears to be some invisible hand, as uh, I was talking about ego Mobe earlier on. There is timidity, there is no, there appears to be some lack of commitment to actually let the uh, lease agreement trade on the open financial markets and, and therefore limiting competitiveness as I already indicated. So, in terms of looking at the way forward, perhaps there may be certain principles that we need to look at in designing uh, our lease, uh, our 99 year lease agreements. And uh, one of the things is that it needs to, we need to have the certainty of the document in the law. Uh, the, pre crucial, the crucial precondition for calculable risk in private decisions is certainty. If you want to calculate the measure of your risk, you want to also know the measure of certainty of the instrument that you have for ownership. Uh, this necessarily entails that you need to have legislation which is unambiguous, which is clear and reliable. You want to have predictability in the transfer and use of land. Uh, the instrument should do provide for an environment which allows for institutional enforcement of claims in cases of disputes. Um, and also which provides for a limitation of and predictability of government action. You know, I'm not saying that government uh, is doing is not doing the correct thing. But I am saying that there has to be predictability in how the government is uh, going to respond to a particular situation. And the events uh, around the first track led reform program do not help the situation. And we need, as we now talk about Zimbabwe is open for business, to actually ensure that we align our instruments with the trajectory that we are saying we want to follow as a country. And uh, the second principle in designing the tenure instrument is the rule of law. There has to be a perception that uh, we respect our national constitution 
and our human rights, there is a separation of the powers of the executive, parliament, and the judiciary, and therefore that these uh, different uh, arms of government can play their part uh, in resolving any matters relating to land uh, tenure security independently of the executive. Uh, there also has to be a measure of democratic accountability uh, which underpins, I mean, through which uh, the participation of stakeholders uh, is underpinned. Uh, and these stakeholders would be landholders, farmers. There has to be an integration of the institutions, in indigenous institutions. It could be the banks, it could be the parliament, it could be the commission, the land commission, and other commissions uh, in the country, and also integrating in indigenous knowledge systems. In other words, when we come up with a tenure instrument that has been crafted following the participation of all these stakeholders, the acceptability of that tenure instrument is going to be higher because the banks will have participated in crafting thereof. Um, the financial, the, 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 the land commission, the people, the farmers will have participated in the crafting of that instrument. But also, most importantly, it allows the state to participate in the regulation uh, and intervening in land administration in line with the national socio-economic imperatives. Uh, that it wants to achieve. In other words, I am not saying that the land, the, 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 I'm saying that the government's participation must be limited to coming up with the policy framework. Thereafter, it's, um, there, there shouldn't be any deviation of the policy in terms of its application. What then remains is for people that are implementing that uh, policy framework to just proceed with the implementation and therefore giving a situation where there is predictability in terms of government action, in terms of how the government is going to react at any particular point in time in the event that there is a dispute in terms of uh, the tenure instrument. And the participation of the different stakeholders will actually ensure the legislation mirrors the obtaining complexities of the social economic uh, climate. And then also, you need to look at the administrative method, the involvement of, this involves a consideration of technical methods such as cadastral surveys, land registration, land information, land taxation, and also even the, in terms of the land administration model that I talked about earlier on, the planning, the land use uh, permits, the land development permits and so on. But of course you need to think about this and obtain a balance uh, of the cost and the benefit of doing it. Uh, ensuring that whatever this instrument, whatever tenure instrument we come up with is fit for purpose. You don't want to go into something that involves high, for example, the surveys where you are highly technical and precise for a certain uh, uh, product, which, which on a farm, for example, uh, which, which really doesn't make a difference whether the big one is uh, one meter away or one meter that side. Perhaps there is really not much difference. So at the end of the day, the, the consideration must be taken to make sure that what we are coming up with in terms of our tenure instruments and our tenure documents, there is uh, a strategic fit uh, and the, the document is fit for purpose. There's no point in defining or designing a gold standard solution which is not going to be used. Simplicity of design is important. The instrument needs to be simple and consistent with the principles of ease of doing business. This is why I'm talking about the 99 year lease agreement that we have being 49 pages, an intimidating 49 pages. I think it simply doesn't work.
Okay. Uh, in, in terms of also principles, further principles, the, pro, the tenor instrument that we, we need to come up with needs to promote efficient and effective land markets that support credit and investment. I talked about that. It entails that banning land is an asset of current realization for agricultural finance, but it also involves government regulating against capture, against inefficient and inevitable consolidation and dis dispossession of the poor. Sorry, that must be dispossession. Uh, is the registered 
and I just found that quite a lot of the concerns and issues that I thought were unique to Zimbabwe are actually universal. So things like communal and socially based tenure being slightly different from um, what is in the cities, urban land tenure. I find it's not just Zimbabwe, it happens in New Zealand, it happens in other countries. In the middle of Oxford in England, there is some communal tenure over Port Meadow in the middle of the city. So um, some of our issues are actually universal. So I'm going to be talking now about a few of those um, principles. So if anyone thinks I'm going to be giving a political type talk, I'm not. I'm talking with sub political um, issues um, and principles, but they're things that I think any time that we do anything with land tenure, we have to be aware of these things because um, people's security of land rights um, are at stake. So, um, making land rights secure, is it just a simple question of putting in enough computers and a land register and training enough people and it's just a technical matter? And the answer is no, it, it's not. Um, land tenure professionals have to be aware of some very complex issues um, to do with um, holding rights in land. So I'm going to put this in three different parts. I'm going to talk about the continuum of land rights between um, socially based tenure and formal tenure on the other, other end. I'm going to look at how people actually get more security for their land in that continuum. And then I'm going to look at a few practical issues for, for introducing um, registration, title to land in that continuum. So there's the continuum. You've got communal or socially based tenure on one end. You've got formal, we sometimes call it Western tenure on the other end. And you've got probably just about three quarters of the world which isn't quite on the one end and it's not quite on the other end. It's somewhere in the middle. Um, and that's, that's actually more common than being at either of the ends. So, uh, when I talk about socially based tenure, I'm talking about um, land which is generally not marketable, you can't freely buy and sell it. Um, rights are generally not exclusive, you can't put up a no, no trespassing sign and keep everybody else off your land. And generally the relationship between your land rights and your social responsibilities, so your, your duty to the community, are very nicely integrated, and that's, that's actually a strength of socially based tenure. Formal tenure, on the other hand, land is typically marketable, you can buy and sell it. Um, rights are generally exclusive, you can put up a no trespassing sign and say, keep off my land. But the relationship between land rights and social responsibilities is quite fragmented. So, have you got two extremes which are utopian, they, they really work well, and a whole lot of chaos in the middle? No. Um, both of those extremes have their own problems. So, let's look at the socially based tenure end of the continuum. And right holders tend to invest quite heavily in social relationships, um, in their relationships with the community. That can result in patronage, nepotism, inconsistent application of the law, and non-competitiveness in a free market. So once you've established those, those, those good social relationships, they can be difficult to withdraw from, and that can result in unproductive patterns of resource use. But there are also issues with formal tenure. So there's a tendency to excesses, to the rich getting richer, the poor getting poorer. As soon as you, as Booker said, you've got title deeds, you can get the people with deep pockets, I think he said, buying up a lot of land. Um, unless you put in a whole lot of controls, death, duties, capital gains, taxes, limits on farm size, and so on. 
that those controls are often quite closely bound up with governance. So the wealthy often possess disproportionate lobbying power to oppose um, that sort of control. There's also in that Western or formal system, there's a tendency to favor the short term. So that the, the amount of time to your next election um, or whatever, it's the short term, whereas the socially based tenure quite often looks to the long term, which is, which is a strip. Commoditized land, as soon as you make land free, uh, able to be bought and sold, it can be sold irresponsibly. For example, by male household heads, they're notorious for doing that sort of thing. Or sold not irresponsibly, but in desperation, so you have a sick, sick child or something, so meet school fees or hospital fees. Um, soon you get represented um, rights on the deed, on a type of deed, um, you can um, make that land more accessible to the rich and powerful. And finally, when you remove social responsibilities from the land tenure equation, there are hidden costs. So you don't have people um, only holding land on condition that they look after the poor and the unemployed and the sick. Um, that's now separate, and um, you've got to have a social security system, and you've got to factor that in to the cost. So, in reality, as I say, most land is somewhere between those two extremes. And um, it varies. When you get closer to the cities, um, you may get reduced tribal authority. Land might start to get a little bit more marketable. It may be less so over on that end. Um, over on this end, um, people might even start uh, preparing their own do-it-yourself diagrams and title deeds. This happened. Um, but there's, there's a very complex, even just in the same district, you can have land which is at different stages on that continuum. And in that continuum, you haven't got all the controls of original socially based tenure, and you haven't got all the controls of uh, formal tenure, and vulnerable groupings, um, the very poor women typically um, are. Their, their land rights and security is very low. Um, you can also get in that continuum land grabs. This has happened in, in um, many places in Africa by multinational companies um, because as soon as you get that land on a title deed or a long lease or something, somebody might be able to come in from overseas and actually get, get rights in that land um, and grab that grab, grab. There's a, a big body of literature on that. So what kind of security do people in that continuum manage to keep? Um, I think there are two main kinds of security. There's um, the security of rights of land, so it links with the land. Surveyors, surveyors love that side. That, that's the sort of thing we as surveyors understand. Title deeds, um, diagrams, survey marks, that sort of thing. It, it's very, very clear to us. But you've also got a security of belonging to a community, and that's, that's more important on the socially based um, end of the, of the spectrum. So, socially based tenure is, is really like a two strand of cord. So, you've got these land links and interpersonal links, and they're very tightly bound up together. But when you um, give title leads, you're actually separating those strands. So, um, you're getting uh, land links backed by a judicial system, paid for by rates and taxes, separate from interpersonal links. So your links with your family, your neighborhood, etc. Those are personal, those are private. You can do them if you want. You can be a lousy neighbor if you want, and you can still keep your land rights. And um, individually, individualizing rights, so getting title deeds is actually a huge thing. We, it's been done, done very lightly in some com countries like Kenya. You have title deeds, and there have been some, some major mistakes where title deeds have been given, and the community has become fragmented. And arguably, this has come out in things like depression, mental health problems, family violence, something like that. So, um, a, yeah, um, an anthropologist. 
anthropologist, a southern African anthropologist, looking at the Shona, said that when you um, separate um, a uh, communal area group of people, it's almost like killing um, a community. It, it's like wounding a, a living organism and it's led to, to die. That's how strong those communities are. And we need to remember that when we start separating social responsibilities and land rights. So, second, second area. How do people actually secure rights? And I think they do it in two different ways. They take bits of custom from the one end, and they adapt that custom, but they also start taking things from the normal end, and, um, for example, making their own um, title deed. So custom can include things like um, you move from one district to the other, you mix the soil, you um, show the ancestors, you, you know, there, there are a lot of um, different ceremonies to do with, with land. Uh, burying birth plants, this is not just Zimbabwe, this is Maori communities, all of Polynesia, um, that sort of thing, forging links to the land. So that sort of custom um, tends to be very persistent. Um, but over on the formal end, people start creating their own DIY title deeds and diagrams. They, they might draw a sketch and say, is this what um, you're buying from me or whatever, and get some witnesses in, and um, they start bypassing the survey profession and creating their own deeds. So, looking firstly, very quickly, I know we're running short of time, so I'm going to rush through this quite fast, but over on the custom side, I think there are three main classes of ceremony. There, there are publicity ceremonies, so when people come onto the land and calling the, the Savoku, the headman, the neighbors, the ancestors, whatever, um, there are things like rates and taxes parties, um, introducing the home to ancestors, community, to God, um, that sort of thing. You talk to people and they say, um, it's that ceremony which gives you the title deeds, as it were, to that land. Because that ceremony is held, nobody can take it away from you. The second kind of custom is connection with specific land. So things like, and again, this doesn't just happen in Africa, um, it happens in New Zealand as well, but putting a, a keg in um, over there, they call it a code whenua, um, just to mark the change in a set of rights over a bit of that. So, so taking customs, uh, laying a branch, or uh, change that, um, or whatever, there, there, there are lots of different customs. And, okay, I'll to skim past that. If we listen to how people speak, um, they say, where, where are you from? They speak sometimes of where their birth port was buried. In New Zealand, they, they say they are Tangata Whenua, that's people of the land, or people where their placenta was buried. This is universal. And there may be special places with particularly strong connection to land. So like kitchens in the Shona culture. You can, you can have um, symbolic graves um, in some of these benches. You can have a, a whole range of customs um, to do with that. People take those customs and they, um, they build them into their security for that land. And then thirdly, there are renewal ceremonies. So ongoing ceremonies over the years. We have nipi, work parties, gifts, mutual health, remittances sent back home, um, just to make sure that you can, when you retire, you can still go back to that bit of land. Um, again, that happens all over the world. So if you don't pay rates in the formal system, um, you may get fined, but if you don't, um, keep up that connection with land in a socially based TV system, you may cease to belong to that community. And that's, that's a very terrible thing. Okay, over on the formal way, how do people get more security to their land and that continue? They start preparing do-it-yourself title deeds. Maybe it's just how much they've paid, when they pay, witnesses, signatures, that sort of thing. Um, some people you talk to say, well, it's the entry in the Sobukul's book which gives me some sort of security over that land. Um, and, um, you know, on that uh, uh, Hedman's Register can be a whole lot of things. It can be used for um, uh, allocations of um, food rations or whatever as well. So it's a very useful 
useful. It's a first stage register. It's a first stage title register which is used for more than just land security, it's used for a whole lot of other things. What about um, the development levy um, register in particular? So um, here's a communal area, um, there's some uh, Menda fields, uh, there's some homesteads, there's some common land uh, or whatever, and people may have a certificate of occupancy. And when you talk to those people, you say, well, you, you've got land which isn't quite, it's no longer pure communal land, it's no longer, it, it's not yet formal tenure, what is your security? And they say, well, this is one of the things um, that is part of our security, this, this register. So that is in effect a first stage title register, and it's a register that people understand, they bought into, um, and they, they accept that it gives them more security. Can we, as administrators, use that and actually make it do even more, rather than creating a whole new um, ladder register? Okay? So people tend to do whatever it takes to secure their land rights. They use elements from the communal side, they use elements from the formal side, and um, both of those give them um, increased security. So last section, we've done one and two now. The third section is what sort of practical issues are there with introducing land registration into communal situations? There, there are a lot of options. I'll say I'm not going to get political, but I mean there are things like 99 year leases, full title deeds, um, there are a whole lot of different ways to do it. What are, what are the, some of the issues involved? Um, so, I think there are at least seven challenges to factor in that we can think about if we do, do that sort of thing. Um, the first thing is that um, when, you see, when you see who's actually living on communal land, maybe they're not the only ones with rights there. Maybe there's somebody living in an urban centre who's sending back remittances and hopes that they will um, have rights when they get sick or old or unemployed. So if you're going to make a land register, maybe you're going to factor in not just the people on the land, but find out who else um, has rights to this land. They've got latent rights. Um, second issue, land is often not owned. So this bit of land I've been near Bulawayo, I've been visiting since 1976, when I was doing an A-level school project, and I know for a fact that it's changed. Um, the people who use that land have changed because one family got smaller, another family had more need, so the land went from one um, to one family to the other. So Udelman, writing about Zimbabwe, says modern cadastral surveys and property rights based on those surveys don't permit the contraction and expansion of boundaries depending on the whereabouts of the male cultivator. Hopefully the male cultivator has changed now, but that's the sort of thing we need to think about. In reintroducing title leads or 99 year leases, is that land actually um, flexible in size? And is that a good thing to give security um, to people in that community? Third thing, shared rights. So you, you sometimes get temporary rights um, and non-exclusive rights like Cattle can graze there for certain times of the year, um, for different seasons. It works. It's for a good, sound reason. Um, maybe water supplies change, or whatever, or set seed distribution changes, or whatever. Maybe you're going to have to factor that into your land register as well. Fourth thing, some customary rights are quite quirky. They, they're quite difficult to represent on a canasta. So, for example, um, maybe Wild fruits on a bit of land can be harvested by anyone, but if you plant a fruit tree there, it can only be um, harvested by a person who plants the tree. Can, can we represent that on a, on a formal capacity? 